our gracious Heavenly Father. We stand in your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, praising you for who you are, for the greatness of your majesty and power and the wonders of your love and grace. We praise you for the privilege and the opportunity to fellowship together in this study of your word. We are keenly aware, O oh Lord, of just how little we know and how great is our God. We commit this time into your hands, asking that the Holy Spirit would just strip away any foolishness, but seal to our hearts the truth of your word and the greatness of your grace and love. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We are studying together in the Epistle to the Philippians, verse by verse. And in our last study together, we were in the area of verses 18 and 19 of chapter 2. We spent a lot of time on several verses, and, and I apologize for spending so much time stuck kind of in one place. But it was important, I felt it was important for us to understand just how important uh, those verses was in relationship when it came to our walk in our conduct our behavior in the body of Christ we're looking for a deliverance in our lives not now that we have been redeemed now we're looking at the word salvation we were redeemed freely by his grace but we're looking at at the all-important matter of salvation and that, that I believe being a deliverance from human merit we see that all through the context, not only here, but we see that in just about every other place that we look in, in Paul's epistles. The, it seems that the, the concentration of at least the mind of the Holy Spirit is, is very much concerned with our walk. Uh, we've been given a particular walk, and most Christians today, I think they misunderstand just what our walk is, uh, consists of. Uh, just what the Christian walk is made up of. The Holy Spirit, well, I think we've seen the Holy Spirit has revealed his heart of love toward us. It's not just that Paul's love toward the Philippians or their, their, his concern and love toward them and, and that mutual love and concern that they had. I think that we see uh, God's love and concern for us as well that we're the center of his attention and that we are the center of his longing. I think that we can take that from the text. I don't see that we're reading anything into the text to also see the heart of the, of the Holy Spirit. I've pointed out time and time again, I, I'm not interested in the least in Paul's logic, uh, his thinking, his mind. These are... Uh, these are precious words given to us by the Holy Spirit. In fact, I don't think Paul understood much of, of what he wrote. It's, it, it, he was no different than us. These, tr these, these truths were, were being worked out in his life, but God used him to compose these letters or to get these letters composed. And, and so it, it's kind of like, I don't know I could use a number of examples. I'll try to I'll try to fit a number of examples into this as we go along. But I think it's an awesome thing, uh, a really amazing thing for the believer in Christ to realize that the world's political situation, the the stuff that we're seeing going on around us, uh, in the world and and in our own country, the political uh, mess, the turmoil, the uh, military situation, uh, the ethnic situation, and, and more, that is not the central theme of glory. It's not the central theme of this book. But we are members of the body of Christ, the very body of Christ. And, and, God, and we can see that God is intimately concerned with us. You know, it took me many years to realize that God was not all that really interested in what I could do for, for him. And, and, and he was not as much 
all that interested in everything that was going on around me because he placed me in an environment in which that would occur. But what he was really interested in was me. And he's interested in you. He's interested in the fellowship, the communion that he has with you. And the Holy Spirit pointed out clearly here in the text that he, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit, longs to be with us because we're of the same mind. And I'll, I'll get, I'll touch on more of that here later, but the, and that the Holy Spirit needed to be here because we're here. And we're here because we need to be here. And that if God had no purpose in our being here, well, we, I don't think we'd be here. So he obviously has a purpose in our being here. And we'd rather be with him. So God has laid out a particular, a very particular walk for us. In fact, in, in our study through uh, Colossians, if, if many of you are here remember, uh, we saw that, that it was by grace that God had given us that, that walk. Then in the, in, in the second chapter uh, here, uh, we were given the illustration of the obedience of the Lord, how that he was submissive to the will of the Father. And it's, of course, we can step away from that and we, could, we can just look at his willingness to become obedient to the will of the Father and not, and not consider our own, the question of our own willingness to be obedient to the will of the Father. And I think we need to understand as we're going through this, just what the will of the Father is for our lives. So, He emptied Himself. Our Lord Jesus Christ, He emptied Himself, and I, and I spent some time pointing out how that His, His obedience to the will of the Father exemplifies an important theological position on our part, that we are to be concerned about God's will for our lives as well, that, that theologically it is, it is filled with importance because it involves the death of the cross. A cross, folks, that crucified self. Self. Uh, we looked at the fact that Christ didn't cease to be God. Uh, the Greek grammar clearly says that he who was God did not cease to be God when he emptied himself. So he surely didn't empty himself of his deity. We, we, you know, he healed the, uh, the sick. He, he gave sight to the blind and, and so on and so forth. And so I suggested... Uh, to you all that he emptied himself of the display of his deity. I believe that, that if he had displayed that glory, uh, you, know, uh, you know, were he to, to display that glory as it was partially displayed on the Mount of Transfiguration, well, they would have all been struck down. He wasn't concerned about the display of who he was uh, uh, as uh, as far as, as, you know, it's like I, I, can't, I can't help but thinking what any one of us would have done. You know, we would have done all these things to show, you know, just, you know, how we're, you know, we're God. And he didn't do that. It wasn't, uh, uh, he didn't glorify himself. I and mean, we know that the Holy Spirit uh, himself claims that, 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 that he would glorify the Son. The Son wouldn't glorify Himself. And, and Jesus prayed that the Father would glorify Him with the glory that He had, you know, before the world began. So in that, we were shown what we also want, and that is to submit ourselves to God because we're His. We really are His. And we were worth what He paid for us, which was the death of His Son. Now, folks, I have consistently pointed out how I'm not interested in capturing Paul's thought. Uh, I'm not worshiping Paul. 
I'm not involved in any kind of, of study that would bring glory to Paul, but glory to Christ. I want to set two accounts before you, you know, in at least in, in, an, in an attempt to at least open our eyes to what I believe the text is teaching us here. We have an account. I believe it's an historical account. Without any question, I believe a man named Paul had thoughts and feelings about the Philippians. But I also believe that we're seeing God's heart toward his people in these verses. Now, those of you who have studied these uh, the scriptures, who actually spend time in this book, you know that we often see more in these accounts than just a, a, an historical account, some sto historical story. I believe there was a man named Paul without any question. I believe he's in prison. I believe he's writing a letter to the church at Philippi. I believe that there are Christians at Philippi. I believe there's a man named Timothy, and I believe there's a man named Epaphroditus. And I believe we have here an historical account of an actual event, that Paul was in prison, that he was concerned for the well-being of the believers there at Philippi, and that he wanted somebody uh, to go to him. And so he sends Timothy. And in addition to sending Timothy, he, he had already decided it was necessary that he send someone else. And, uh, and the, which was Epaphroditus. And the reason he sent him is because people knew that he'd been sick. And apparently they were concerned about that. Now, it's, it's easy to, to just... <laughs> Read fast through this, folks, and miss seeing what I believe we ought to see. Epaphroditus had been sick. Well, it's it's okay. So it's it's kind of an incidental mention, right? Epaphroditus had been sick. Well, we can see from the text God heals those who are sick. That's that's wonderful. But can we not see more in this? Uh, I mean, that Paul in prison was concerned for the well-being of the believers at Philippi, that he wanted somebody to go with him. He sends Timothy. He also sends Epaphroditus. And apparently the, the Philippians were concerned about, about Epaphroditus. And so God wanted to reassure them that Epaphroditus was all right. And I think all of that happened, folks. I do. I'm not going to argue with any of you that all this really happened, that this is an historical account. It's an accurate historical account. And those can serve as, as examples for us in our Christian life. I have no problem with that. I know that in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, I see a, a an amazing truth. Just like like Eve was taken out of Adam, I've been taken out of Christ and made part of the body of Christ. Did you know that you were taken out of Christ? Just as Eve was taken out of Adam. Bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. We don't have any problem seeing that when we look at that. Yeah, I believe there was a real Adam. I, be I believe that there was a real Garden of Eden. I believe that God really made Eve from something that he took from Adam. But in a much greater way, dearly beloved, I see a marvelous picture of those of us who are members of the body of Christ being formed by God for Christ. That we, in fact, were taken out of Christ. In fact, if back in Ephesians, if you remember, uh, we were told this is a great mystery. Not, not a mystery, not, not that it's difficult to understand, but this is a marvelous, important revelation. We're part of the body of Christ because we were taken out of Christ. And even though the Holy Spirit says this is a great mystery, you know, but I'm speaking about Christ in the church, yet Christianity in the main today, almost without exception, they make that passage primarily a passage about a husband and a wife. And, and, you know, secondarily, uh, it's uh, about Christ and the church. 
I'm perfectly willing to agree with all of the historical facts. So here in Philippians chapter 2, I believe that we can see a lesson in the, in the dedication of Paul, the service of Timothy, the love of Paul and the Philippians toward one another. But I'm persuaded, folks, that there's more there. The name Timothy means... In, in stark contrast to that, okay, Epaphroditus, devoted to Venus or, or Aphrodite's. Now, people often accuse me of, of reading, you know, between the uh, lines, uh, maybe too much, or, you know, reading the white spaces and stuff, but I'm sorry, I, I cannot help but see an Epaphrodite as something more than just someone who was sick that God healed and that cared very much about the Philippians and vice versa. Uh, I, be, I believe that we can, we can uh, well, let, let me just say this. What really is God really? I mean, what is he really saying to me here? When he, when he, when he, he could have chose a number of people, but he chose Timothy and Epaphroditus, two exact opposites as far as name meaning goes. What is he trying to tell me? What's God trying to tell me in this passage over and above the fact that the Apostle Paul had a heart of commitment and concern, that, that Timothy had a, a heart of service, and Epaphroditus had a heart of love? I mean, am I twisting the Scriptures? Am I looking beyond what's written to suggest that in the Apostle Paul, I see God speaking, just, just as we've been saying all along, that I see a revelation of the heart of God. It's, I mean, it's one thing to say that Paul longs to be with God and the Philippians, but, but is that all I see in this letter? Do I see the fact that maybe I ought to long to be with other Christians? How about that? Or do I, or do I see the fact that God Almighty revealed the longing of His fellowship and communion with us? Why can't I see in the person of Timothy the work of the Holy Spirit? I touched on this, and in, in, I, I believe I did in the previous video. I don't have anybody like-minded who will naturally care for your state, okay? That's, that's quite a, a statement. Paul has no one. I, I read in verse 20, I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state, that all seek their own, not the things of Jesus Christ. All seek their own, is what it says. That's what our text says. Well, that, that really can't mean that. I mean, you know, I just couldn't, it couldn't have meant that then. It, it, it certainly, certainly it doesn't mean that now. What if I was to tell you that of all the viewers that are viewing this, not one of them cares about your spiritual state? Not one. You know, you would probably argue, well, Steve, I, I believe that there are many who do. And we could look at Paul's life and we could say, we, we could almost assume that surely there must have been someone that would naturally care for their state. The word, it's, folks, the language God uses is very precise and it's very interesting here. I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. What state? Well, your physical and well-being as well as your spiritual state. I'll, I'll, I'll suggest it means both, okay? Uh, but now nah, that really doesn't mean that. What that really means is that everybody Paul knew, and, and of course, he had a very limited fellow. We know he had a very limited fellowship because he was in prison, okay? Right? 
So what few Christians he knew in Rome, well, they, they sought their own things. That's what he's saying. Not the things of Jesus Christ. And maybe that's true of all the, the people that Paul knew. You know, that he didn't have anybody other than, than, than Timothy who was like-minded, who would naturally care for their state or, or genuinely, sincerely, the word naturally in your book, in your authorized version means sincerely from the heart. Now, as I, as I often say, I'm not asking anybody to agree with me. I just want you to think about it. I think the Holy Spirit is saying that apart from the Holy Spirit, nobody would naturally care for the spiritual well-being of another person. Okay? That's what I believe it's saying. And that's quite a statement. That's quite a theological stance, okay, to take. What it basically suggests is it suggests that any concern I have on my part towards you, if it, if it comes from the, the, the mind of the flesh, it's of no value whatsoever. So I just want you to think about it. Sincerely care. Genuinely care for their physical, of course, okay? But moreover, their spiritual state. That apart from the ministry of the Holy Spirit, every single one of us seek the things of our own. Not the things of Christ. And I recognize, folks, that I could... I could pray to cross the screen a list of Christian heroes who clearly in their lives, I mean, apparently they put the things of Christ before their health, before their financial success, before their security, before their well-being, before their happiness. I know that. But I'm saying that you couldn't do that apart from the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I see in Epaphroditus, the ministry of Christians who have an old nature devoted to Venus, devoted to Aphrodite. Okay, the name means favored by Aphrodite or Venus, and the new nature, the new nature, the sinless new man that has the mind of the Holy Spirit. In the ministry of Timothy and it, and in the ministry of Epaphroditus, I see the old man and the new man. And Epaphroditus becomes a new creation in Christ Jesus. This, Paul says he was sick. He was sick. He was nigh unto death. But God had mercy on him. And not on him only. But on me also. Lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Yeah, I believe Epaphroditus lived. I believe that... He was real sick. I believe he got better. I believe God healed him. I believe all of the historical accuracy of this account. I believe that, folks, with all of my heart. But I believe there's a tremendous message here that God is working in the fellowship of believers who are new creations in Christ who were snatched from the jaws of death. The, the context clearly reveals a redemption by grace and a salvation, a, a deliverance from human merit. I mean, don't we have concern for others in the body of Christ? I'm concerned about the spiritual understanding of those who belong to Christ. If I didn't, I wouldn't be doing this. I'm concerned about the spiritual understanding of those who belong to Christ. I'm, I am intensely concerned with the cancer on the body of Christ. The cancer of, that, of the fleshly, carnal, legal-oriented, human merit-based system. Human merit-based walk that I see called the Christian life. I am intensely concerned. Because I see the text, I read from the text that God is, is intensely concerned about that. 
And I believe just as God did with Adam and Eve and just as he did with Abraham, I believe I see here not only a, a, an historical account. You know, folks, there must have been 10,000 historical accounts, but God chose this one to reveal once again. I believe in historical type, the work of the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ. We are people snatched back from death. We are people who are made new creations in Christ. We're people who have been gifted with the concern and the prayer and the anguish of other members of the body of Christ. And we rejoice together in what God has done through the Lord Jesus Christ. I think it's sad that that, that rejoicing and that communion and that fellowship can become so obscured by our daily activity, by the concerns of our life, by the things that we do. I, I think it'd be terribly embarrassing if I was to throw up a list right here on the screen here of the hours that I spend in prayer and in the study of God's Word and communion with Him and then, and then put right next to that all the time that I spend devoted to other things. You know, I, I wonder I wonder if the discipline of our time and our talent might not well be a, a good indicator of the measure of our love and our concern for God and for one another. What I see in this passage of Scripture is an intense concern on the part of my Heavenly Father and the work of the Holy Spirit. I praise God for that. It staggers, folks, it staggers my imagination that I could be of any concern to God at all. I can see in this passage that Paul is not concerned about his situation in prison. And now I can and now I can spend an hour exalting Paul and telling you what just what a great person Paul was. You know, and just and how that you ought to be just like Paul. I see that God is not primarily concerned with Himself, but with me. That the Holy Spirit's mind is one of sincerity toward me. Mine may not be toward Him, but, he, but His is toward me. In fact, the word like-minded there in your text. It's the only place in the New Testament that that word occurs. The only place. There's a Greek word, uh, iso, from which we get the word isotope. The word like really is wrong. There's a Greek word, iso, okay, which means equal. Okay, that's what the word means, equal. And the word minded is not our mind here. It's not the Greek word for mind. It's the, it's the Greek word for soul, sukos, soul. Okay, I believe the word means life, equal life. Do you know, folks, that your life is equal with that of the Holy Spirit? That you are a new creation in Christ Jesus? If, if you do not realize this day, if you are not 100% convinced that you are as righteous as Christ and as precious to God as, as is Christ, then you don't believe what God has said in this book. We have been snatched from the fire, folks. Worshippers of Aphrodite. And, and folks, I can see that every day. I can see that every day on TV, in, in, in books, entertainment, the news media, advertising media. We are a nation devoted to Aphrodite. All right, and if you don't know what that means, look it up. But God has made us new creations in Christ. I, I don't want to uh, detract from any historical accuracy in this text. I believe it is historically accurate, but I long for you to see how much God is interested in you, 
how much that he has provided for you and how much he's made you a new creation in Christ. And the natural result of that, okay, is that we care for each other in Christ. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest that we see that. We see that in this fellowship. You see that in other fellowships too as well. I see it in the correspondence that I have with you, the messages you leave. I praise God for you people. I praise God for what I've seen here. I recognize there's a lot of flesh, but the evidence is clear that we do love one another in Christ. And I praise God that in this marvelous account, we can see that we have a God who says, I'm absolutely convinced that I'm coming. Don't miss that. I trust in the Lord that I shall come shortly. Verse 24. Did you catch that? The word for trust there is, is python. It's persuaded. Now, I have no argument with anybody, you know, that Paul was persuaded he was going to come. I think he did. Historically, I think he did. But oh, more than that, I see a statement of fact on the part of my lovely Lord. Listen, I'm going to come, and I'm going to come shortly. I'm going to come quickly. That's a common message from our Lord Jesus Christ. That isn't the first time I've ever heard that. I come quickly is something the Lord repeats several times. I wonder how much the certainty of his soon return and the hope of his, of his coming for us is a valid part of our Christian experience. I expect him every moment, and so should we all. I think it's only fitting as I close down uh, this video to... to to draw your attention over to 2 Timothy. Timothy, chapter 2. I'm, I'm going to read a few verses from that. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from, and this is articulated, you see the definite article, the fornication, that you abstain from fornication uh, in, the, in the physical sense. Well, of course, of course. Nobody's going to argue that. The text says the fornication, that is spiritual adultery, that is that you abstain from having an affair with that of which you, you are no longer involved. I mean, you are not involved. You've never been involved with this other thing, okay? Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. We're not... We are a spouse to Christ. We are not to have an endless flirtatious affair with the law. Okay? That is the fornication. Okay? Spiritual adultery. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. The Lord knows them that are His, and let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. What, an, what, what is he talking about? Self-righteousness. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor, some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strifes, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient and meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. I know many of you, and I, I can I can tell from the correspondence that you've you've that we've had. You would you would, without a doubt, you would fall into that category of those who were taken captive by Satan to do his will 
and yet God, okay, recovered you from that snare of the devil. Not me, but God. The Holy Spirit, through the ministry of the gospel and the ministry of the truth, you were rescued, you were recovered from out of the snare of the devil where that you were taken captive by him at his will. Okay? And folks, if you cannot see that all of this that we've been look, looking at, all of this exists within the sphere of, I don't know if I'm, gonna, if I'm saying this right or not. that the entire subject surrounds it, concerns itself. This whole subject here concerns itself with our deliverance from that world system based on human performance. Human merit, human performance fits nowhere into any of this. Why? Because we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, knowing it is God at work in us, both the will and do of His good pleasure. That working out that salvation, that is our working out that deliverance from the human merit-based system. I've, I've often said if, if all we did was just give God glory, honor, and praise, thank Him for everything that He's done, who He is, everything He's done, is doing, and will do in our lives. If that is all we did, we wouldn't have time to do anything else. Folks, it's not about us. It's all about Him. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, rest in Him. Thanks for watching.